nine in our uh, forerunner school class, the uh, theology of the bride. Um, and I've titled it uh, Esther, the book of Esther, Esther uh, and Bridal Purpose and Preparation. Uh, Esther and Bridal Purpose and, and Preparation. And this is uh, one session of a two session uh, mini series within this class about the book of Esther. I'm going to talk this time about God's eternal purpose as it's reflected in this book of Esther and, and the call to preparation to be a bride made ready. Uh, and then in the next session, we'll deal with uh, Esther and, and bridal partnership uh, and in terms of the unveiling the, the end time role of the bride and the eternal role of the bride in partnership with Christ. Uh, and so uh, I'm excited about it. I know that um, for some who, who are listening or watching this, you've studied Esther and we've taught about it uh, a number of times over the years. And for some, it'll be new. Uh, but I, there, the Lord has really has given me some fresh revelation and understanding uh, of this. So I think it'll be fresh for everybody. Uh, but I'm excited about it because the book of Esther uh, really unfolds in, in a relatively short period of time, you know, 10 chapters. So it's not a, not a long book, but it's a profound book. It never mentions the Lord. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the name of the Lord is not mentioned in it. Uh, Jerusalem is not mentioned in it. Uh, but yet it's profound because it paints a wonderful picture in type and shadow form of, uh, of King Jesus and his bride uh, and the role of the bride. It pictures the purpose for the bride, the, the call of the bride, the preparation of the bride, uh, the role the bride will play in end time issues that are really on, up, upon us uh, right now, and, and even the, the role that the bride will play throughout eternity. So it's, uh, it's a profound book. And, and the reason I wanted to put it into this class is because really unlike any other book in the Bible, it just unfolds in a, a kind of a panoramic view uh, all of the various uh, details and aspects of the bride making herself ready uh, and the role that the bride will play uh, throughout uh, eternity, in the end times and throughout uh, eternity. Uh, so uh, I'm excited about it. I've, I, I love this whole book and, and the teachings there uh, from it. Uh, I want to share this and, and you know, some of those have been with us for a no, number of years. You, you've heard all our stories, but this, this one is, I think, important, even though you probably heard it a hundred times. But uh, Noel and Diane, who are, were our close friends, and still uh, are our close friends. Noel has gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, but they would come every year or every two years and, and spend a few weeks in ministry. And, uh, and so one year, this was probably in the late 90s, maybe somewhere around there. So it's been a number of years ago. Uh, on the ride, uh, we were taking them back to the airport. They had uh, ministered for a couple of weeks, two or three weeks. And we were taking and driving them back to the airport. And uh, Donna and Di were in the back seat and they were talking about shopping and uh, clothes and stuff like that. And so Noel in the front, it was in the front seat uh, and Noel began to uh, just, for somehow we got on the topic of the book of Esther. Uh, and he began to just share the, type of, the, the types and the shadows in the book of Esther. Uh, and it was like, wow, yeah, I never, I had never seen any of that before. It was about a 45 minute uh, ride. But what that did, I, I, it, it stirred my heart uh, just to go back and begin to really study the book of Esther. And so I spent quite a bit of time uh, just studying Esther and those that were with us at that point in time, no, I knew I, I taught on it for a long, forever, it seems. You probably think, okay, we ever teach anything else. I taught on it forever. But it, it made such a lasting impact upon me that even now, I mean, decades later, I still go back and look at that book and, and the teachings of that book 
and apply them to different aspects of, of the New Testament as it relates to the bride making herself ready. Now, you want, maybe you're wondering why am I sharing that story. Here's the reason. I'm, my prayer has been that you would make this teaching this week and next week your ride to the airport. That you would, that you would see the nuggets in this and that you would go and dig into it yourself. Because there's no way I can, in, in two sessions, really unveil this, the, the depth of this book. Uh, but I pray that this will be your ride to the airport, where what I will share will stir you like what Noel shared with me stirred me, that you'll dig into this and get this framework. It's a really a framework of the bride, the call of the bride, the preparation of the bride, the purpose of the bride, and the end-time role of the bride. And it'll, it, it will impact, I pray that it will impact you uh, like it has me. Amen. Can I hear an amen on that? Amen. Amen. All right. If you said amen, then I'm expecting you to do some real in-depth study of the book of Esther. Amen. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's get into it. Uh, you know, there's just no way we're going to be able to read um, everything that we, we need to. But let me just give a little bit of a, uh, of a summary of it. Um, I'm, I'm sure you know the story. Uh, we're going to deal with the first two chapters uh, today, and then next time we'll deal with the rest of the book. Uh, but you know what happened. The, the king of Syria, the king of Persia, was having a, was having a, a feast, a, a 180-day feast. Uh, that's, that's quite a feat. That's half a year where he would brought all his princes and his uh, rulers in from all over the 127 provinces, all over the world, from India all the way to where, you know, to the west, wherever that it would be in. But he, would, he, he brought them all in, and he, he was probably planning a campaign against, uh, against Greece, but he, would, he brought them all in, and they, uh, they feasted, and they... And they uh, planned this battle. And then at the end of that, he had a seven-day feast uh, for all the people in, this, in the capital city, seven-day feast. And at the end of that seven days, on the seventh day, he wanted to bring in uh, Vashti. And Vashti was his queen, his bride, because uh, she was having her own feast. But Vashti, uh, as you know, refused to come in. He wanted to display her beauty uh, to all the princes and the rulers and uh, all of the people, but she refused. And so, obviously, the king got upset. Uh, let me just say this, too. You, you, we have to take this out of the natural or it can get, it can deteriorate uh, pretty quickly, uh, but you have to take it into the spiritual realm. But in the spiritual realm, he was angry uh, because she would not come in for him to display her beauty. And so he issues a decree that if she's allowed uh, to remain without being dealt with, then uh, one, all the, all the women in the kingdom would uh, turn against their husbands and not respect their husbands. And he said also, in addition to that, that uh, in, in addition to that, he said, no longer will she be in my presence. Now, there's some, I'm sharing these details because there's some points here that we'll get into in a minute. Uh, so he issues a decree and he sends out, he sends out all of the over, word to all the overseers all throughout all the, uh, all the kingdom. And he says, okay, I want you to bring all the beautiful young women uh, in uh, virgins into the capital and I want them to be prepared uh, so that I can pick a new queen. Uh, and he takes them through 12 months of, of treatment, um, oil of myrrh treatments, spices and cosmetics. Uh, and then he, they go in to the king and then they come back and, and they stay in a different uh, harem. 
Uh, and then at the, at the end of that, he picks the queen. And of course, we know that Esther was the queen that he picked. Now, we'll deal with the rest of it next in the next session. You know the story that uh, she was born for such a time as this because there was a plot against uh, her people and uh, Haman was raised up as a picture of the Antichrist and the Antichrist kingdom. And she intercedes for that and as, as she intercedes uh, for that, she saves her people. And the, and where the, the gallows that were prepared uh, for Mordecai uh, were actually used to hang Haman and his ten sons. So anyway, there's a there's a beautiful picture throughout uh, all of this. Uh, so that's kind of the that's kind of the story. Just a little bit of the types and shadows here. You know, we got King Assyrius. King Assyrius is the uh, is a type and shadow of Christ as the king. Now, again, we have to, he's certainly not a, a, an accurate, clear representation of Jesus in terms of his character, but he is a king over a, over a global uh, empire. Uh, and so in our story, he pictures Christ. Uh, Vashti pictures that part of the bride uh, that is independent and rebellious and refuses to be cooperative. Uh, and there's Vashti. Vashti is not so much, okay, this person over here is a Vashti, that person over there is a Vashti. Vashti is more who, wh that part of us that's in each and every one of us that is rebellious and independent and refuses to submit to the king. So we have Mordecai, who's the, uh, the guardian of Esther. Mordecai is a picture of the Holy Spirit, and there's stuff in the notes that you can see the, uh, the, the application of that as a support for that. Uh, Haggai uh, is one of the, four, uh, is one of the um, eunuchs that helped um, Esther. And so as such, uh, Haggai is a picture of, of, of forerunners, of a forerunners. You know, forerunners, uh, in a sense, are spiritual eunuchs. Uh, they are those that are, they don't take the bride for themselves. Uh, they're there to prepare the bride for the king, and that only. And so the, the eunuchs there are pictures of forerunners. Uh, and then, of course, we have, uh, we have Esther. Uh, and Esther, the name Esther was given to her when she entered uh, the harem, in the Persian harem. And so... Uh, it means star or, uh, you know, so you, you look at the names and it means basically a superior one. The Hebrew name uh, was Myrtle, it meant Myrtle, but basically it was one who was, who was in obscurity, who was hidden, but comes to authority, comes to power uh, for such a time uh, as this. So anyway, that's, uh, I know that's a little bit, tedious and a little bit boring, but I, I feel like I need to do this uh, in order to set the stage uh, for what we're talking about. And so, you know, we see all these characters, uh, and now what we have, what we want to draw, what we want to do is draw some principles uh, from, uh, from this, first for the purpose of a bride made ready, the purpose of a bride made ready, and then secondarily, we'll look at the preparation of the bride made ready. We'll draw some principles for it. Um, as we look at chapter one, we see the purpose of a bride made ready. What we see is that when ki the king gave this 180 day banquet with just the princes and the rulers, no people, none of the people were there. It's a picture of eternity past where God in his, uh, and his counsel, his eternal counsel, creates the plan for all of the ages. And we see the plan unfold as we go through uh, the book of, of Esther. We see the, the plan unfolding uh, there. Uh, and what we, we see is like four different aspects of, the, of God's eternal purpose dis displayed there. One, we see that the king won't, will have a worthy bride for Christ. 
he will be determined to have a worthy bride for Christ. You know, Vashti was not worthy, so he said, I'm going to replace her with one who is more worthy than her. And so there's a principle for that in, in God's eternal plan, and he will work toward that principle. He will have a bride who is worthy. And what he wants is for every one of us and all of those, everybody in the, all of creation to be a part of this bridal people. But, they, but the Vashti, the unworthy, the rebellious, the independence has to be moved out because he will have a worthy bride who is one made, made ready for him. That's the first part of his eternal plan. That is part of And he's working on that. You know, we can say, well, he wants this or he wants this objective. He wants that objective. Well, those may be secondary objectives, but his overall objective is that he will have a worthy bride for Christ. Amen? Amen. The second aspect uh, of that, uh, of God's purpose that we see in this book, is that he will have a bride who he can display in her beauty and glory at the end of the age. You know, it's really interesting. The se there was a seven-day banquet for the people of the land, but they were free. And there was no compulsion to celebrate in whatever way they chose. But at the end of the seven days, you know, a lot of people say seven days or seven is a picture of the uh, history of mankind uh, in the earth. 7,000 years. But at the, end of the, at the end of the church age, he wants to bring his bride. He wants to bring his bride before the princes, the rulers, demon, demonic rulers, uh, heavenly rulers, people, all the people of the earth, and display this bride in all of her beauty, all of her glory, that's what, and we see that in the book of Ephesians. You know, Jesus will present to himself uh, his church in all of her glory, without spot, blameless, without spot, or without wrinkle. See, that's part of God's purpose. And he's, work, he's, he's working towards these, per, this purpose. This, this is another aspect of what he's working toward, to prepare this bride, however long it takes, to prepare this bride who will display the glory of Christ within them. Oh, man. Don't you, doesn't that make you want to be a part of it? Amen. Okay. All right. The third aspect of his eternal purpose is he wants a bride in it that he can have a close, intimate, personal relationship with. He wants a bride who, who will please him, please him in the secret place. That, that will love him. You know, we talked in, in earlier about first love. He wants one who will love him with that first love type of love, who will understand that he loves her with, a, with an unfailing love. And, and to have an intimate fellowship, spiritual now, spiritual relationship there. That's part. And he's working toward preparing a people who can be that way. See, Vashti couldn't do it. He said to Vashti, look, she's rebellious. No longer, no longer will she be able to come in to my presence because of her character, because of the issues in her life. And so he's, he's dealing with a bride. He's dealing with a betrothed bride right now. He's dealing with us and he's wanting to transform us so that it, even in, in an eternity, we can be in that most intimate place and intimate relationship with him. So the preparation is toward uh, that goal among the others. Uh, and then the fourth purpose that we see in the book is that we see that he is, he is preparing a people who can be his end time and eternal partners. You, you know, you look at you look at later on in the book, and we'll look at it more next, next time. Esther, her, there was an attack upon her people. Haman was going to destroy her people. 
And she comes to before the king. Mordecai, the Holy Spirit, says to her, you've got to come before the king and you've got to petition him to spare the people. And she said, well, I may perish. But she said, if I perish, I perish. But I have been born for such a time as this. Let me just say this. You have been born for such a time as this. There's no doubt in my mind that none of us are here right now by accident. There's not a single one of us that would, should have been born a uh, hundred years ago. We're all in God's sovereign call, born for such a time as this. But he wants us, because we are born for such a time as this, to stand up and be a part of that inter, inter, uh, uh, his end time and eternal partner. Because he said, he said, Esther, because she had pleased him, she had prepared, and he says, Esther, what is your petition? Up to half my kingdom I will give to you. In other words, you can partner with me in these end times. And you know, as the world spirals downward out of control, there's more and more and more responsibility being given to the church, to the bride, to pray, to minister, to be a voice so that, that one, we can pray against the issues that are arising, but also to be that messenger, to be that voice, to bring people into the kingdom. Uh, and so we see, we see that, uh, that God has these purposes displayed in this book, these four purposes, and there may even be others. But he knows that Vashti, so we, we want to talk now about the preparation. So Vashti, she wouldn't come. So he says, We're going to find, I'm going to find a bride more worthy than she. And what does he do? He sends out uh, his, uh, uh, his forerunners, his eunuchs, to tell the overseers to gather people and bring them in to the uh, to the a capital to be prepared. And so from that, uh, we draw seven different principles or uh, points of aspects of application uh, for this, for the preparation. And we'll draw it from Esther, uh, mainly chapter two. Here, here the, here's the first one. First, believers and non-believers alike must be invited into a bridal relationship with Christ into a vital uh, invited into a bridal relationship uh, with Christ. Here, let me just read the scripture. Then the king's attendants who served him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Let the king appoint overseers in all the promises provinces of his kingdom that they may gather to every beautiful young virgin to the citadel of Susa to the harem into the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women and let their cosmetics be given to them. And so what did he do? He sent out, he sent out his, his servants to the overseers, to the pastors and to the leaders throughout the whole kingdom. And he says, bring them into the house, to the, to the custody of the eunuch. Now that's a picture of the forerunners. Uh, to those friends of the bridegroom, they might be prepared. Um, and so this is a word this is a word to, to forerunners. And this is a forerunner school, and this is a session uh, of a forerunner school. Forerunners have to be a people who invite people to come into the preparation process. You know, we saw it in our last, one of our last teachings on Matthew chapter 22, where he sent out people into the highways and byways to invite people to the marriage supper, to the wedding feast. It's the same concept. He's saying, forerunners, you have, to, you have to be alert. You have to be open to invite people not only to salvation. Yes, that's part of it. It's the first step, and nobody would be prepared without salvation. But to prepare them also to come to the marriage supper, the wedding uh, uh, feast, to be prepared to be that eternal bride of Christ, the eternal wife of the Lamb. Now, some have, we all have different opportunities and different uh, platforms to, in order to invite people. 
Uh, you know, pastors can invite their churches and invite other pastors and people that they have relationship with. Some who are not pastors don't have the opportunity to invite uh, maybe large uh, numbers. But you can invite, but the Lord will give you opportunity to invite. You know, I know uh, Donna has, has this uh, real heart to invite people uh, to, uh, to understand the bridal picture, the bridal framework, and to, be, to make themselves ready. And so when she has opportunity, she asks, you know, one-on-one or uh, mainly one-on-one uh, to, to understand this bridal thing because there's so many people in the body of Christ who have absolutely no understanding about the need for the bride to be made, to be made ready. Uh, and we've talked about that uh, in, a, in this class quite a bit. So whatever your platform is, Forerunners, uh, whatever your platform is, we need to be alert. We need to be open and, in, and invite those that are born again and those that are not first into the kingdom, but, but more than that, into the preparation process to be made ready as a bride for Christ. There's a challenge to us. God wants this. And, and, and if this bridal revival takes place, there's going to be more and more responsibility on our part to invite people to come into the preparation process. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's the first one. The second uh, aspect is that those, um, those, who, who, those invited must respond positively to the invitation. You know, in, in the book of Esther, they probably didn't have much choice. If the king came and said, okay, you're coming to be prepared to be, uh, to, 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 to be possibly the wife of the king, they probably didn't have much choice. But, you know, you can just imagine the different attitudes that, that, that might have been there uh, among the young ladies. We don't really know how many were brought, but I have a feeling it was a, a large number. And probably there was a lot of different attitudes. Some probably didn't want to come at all. They were saying, you know, they may have been uh, betrothed to, to someone in their village or, you know, they didn't want to leave their family or they didn't want to do this or that. And they didn't even want to come, but they had to, they had to come. But they, their attitude was they didn't even want to come to the preparation process. We, of course, we see that all, all over the place in our culture today. That people don't want to come to that. Uh, there probably were others because, you know, there was a lot of rural, uh, a lot of these young ladies lived in very rural, very poor uh, settings. And they probably, some would say, you know, I, I've, I can just come and live in the palace, have fine dining, fine food, don't have to work the fields. They were just content to live in the house. Boy, there's a lot of people like that. You know, I just want to go, I just want to get to heaven. Well, we all want to get to heaven. Everybody, everybody wants to go to heaven. It's a lot better than the alternative. I mean, I don't know for sure what the alternative is like, but I don't want to find out. I want to go to heaven. But that that attitude won't make you ready to be prepared as the bride. I've got to be more than just, I've got to be more than just uh, want to get to heaven. I've got to want to be the, the wife of the lamb, which leads to a preparation process. So there were some that probably were just content going there. There were probably others who said, who thought in their hearts, you know, I really do want to be the wife of the lamb, but, you know, there's 200 candidates here odds of me actually being that one, pretty small. So I'm just going to go through the motions of it. There are a lot of people like that. You know, I, yeah, I'll, you know, when the pastor says, let's make ourselves ready, yeah, I'll say yes to it. Uh, it altar calls given, yeah, I'll say yes. But they don't really put energy into it. But, and they'll never become the wife of the lamb without that, my opinion. 
But there's some, like Esther, who said yes with an attitude of I really want to fully cooperate with Mordecai, a picture of the Holy Spirit, with Haggai, a picture of the forerunners. I want to cooperate. I want to listen. And you can, re- you can see it in the chapters there as you read through this. I want to fully, fully, fully cooperate with them because I want to be the wife of the king. That's the attitude that we have to have. That's the attitude that as we go out and invite people, we have to try to convince them that that's the attitude that they have to have, uh, that they must respond positively to the invitation. Third, being made ready as a bride requires a, a, a lifelong cooperation uh, with the Holy Spirit as he leads us into the preparation process. Third, being made ready as a bride requires a lifelong cooperation with the Holy Spirit as he leads us in the preparation process. It's not about doing more. No, more. It's not about doing more work or whatever. It's about a lifelong commitment to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us uh, and we say we obey what he says, whether it's through the written word or whether it's through his voice directly to us. Over our lifetime, the Lord will take us through step after step after step where in these steps we have to be cooperate cooperate with the Holy Spirit, with the voice of those who are preparing us so that at the end of that time we can be ready. It's, it's a, it, there's a magnitude of preparation in comparison to the, what the goal is that most of us don't consider. But, you, you know, just think about this. The young ladies had to go through one full year of preparation for one night with the king. One year of preparation for one night with the king. And that seems like, that seems a little bit overdone, you know. Um, One year preparation for one night. And so I'm saying that to try to, for us to understand there is a great magnitude of preparation that the Lord wants to do to make us be, become the eternal wife of the Lamb. It's a, there's a, it's a lifelong. The 12, I mean, they had one year, 12 months, but 12 is not, for us, it's not one literal year. That would be easier. It's like the hand of God. 12 is like the governmental, uh, a, a, a number of government. It's like the governmental hand of God over our lives for the rest of our lives with, with us with an attitude like we talked about a minute ago, with the attitude of I want to be made ready as the bride. I want to be made ready as the bride. I I don't want to be content just living in the house. I don't want to be content just going through the motions. I don't want to say no. I want to be the wife of the lamb. With that as our attitude, it's uh, it's a lifelong uh, process of submitting to the, the, the lordship of Christ uh, to, to be made ready. Now, it's not doing more, but it's like the Lord brings up something in our, in our life. I want you to deal with this. Deal with it. I want you to do this. Do it. it it's, those, it's that type of, uh, uh, of an attitude. But, the, but to get to the, where he speaks to us in this way, we have to understand that this is, what, this is the process that the bride will have to go through, that she will have to go through a lifelong process of allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, uh, to bring healing and to bring uh, us to the cross, to embrace things where our self-life and our soul life and, and actions are inconsistent 
with him so that we repent when we need to repent. We say yes when we need to say yes. We do those things that we need to do. And at the end of our life, we just believe that God in his faithfulness and his grace will make us ready as his eternal wife. But it's a lifelong process of submitting to the Holy Spirit and to the voice of, of messengers, forerunner, Haggai, uh, to do what he says uh, to do. This is, this is real. This is the real thing. Don't, don't pass this off because this is real. Um, all right, so that's the life lesson number three, the lifelong process. Number four, being made ready as a bride requires a believer to be conformed well, let me, let me read it. I added a little insert here. Fourth, being made ready as a bride requires a believer to embrace the cross life and to be so as to be fully conformed into the image of Christ. Uh, now, when the, here's Esther 2.12. Now, when the turn of each young lady came to go into the king of Syria, after the end of her 12 months under the regulations for women, for the days of their beautification were completed as follows. Six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and cosmetics for women. So they had 12 months, six months of oil of myrrh treatments and six months of, of spices and cosmetics. Now, the oil of myrrh, myrrh, as you, I'm sure, are aware, was a, a burial spice. It was bitter to the taste, but it had a sweet fragrance to it. It was used to anoint uh, uh, in burial. It was a part of the drink that was given to Jesus on the cross. Uh, it's part of the anointing oil. It's, it's, it's used in many, many ways, but it's a symbolic picture of, of dying to self and dying to the self-life. And so the, when the ladies would come into the, to the harem to be prepared, what would they do? They first, they, they first had to go through six months of, of, oil, of uh, oil of myrrh uh, treatments. And what was the purpose of it? It would bring out all the impurities in their, in their body. You know, a lot of them lived in a rural area. They were, they were farmers. And, you know, you could just picture the grime and dirt under their fingernails and all the, and just in the natural. And so the, it, it brought a cleansing of that. And so that's what, that's what this oil uh, of myrrh treatment was to do in the natural. But for us, it's, it's, a, it's a sign of going to the cross, dying to the self-life, to bring out all the impurities out of our, out of our life all the self issues and the sin issues out of our life so that we will be a sweet aroma unto the king. So then they went through, after that, they went through another six months of spices and cosmetics. Think, let's talk about the spices for a minute. We have to go to, first we need to go to Song of Songs, Song of Solomon to see uh, the, about the spices, the treatment of the spices. It was interesting. The uh, and you, you know I won't turn there, but you t you you go you look at Song of Songs. The it's a picture of Jesus as a bridegroom king and the Shulamite maiden as the bride making herself ready. You know, and so you know at first she wouldn't go to the cross. He said he wanted her to go go to the cross. He wanted her to embrace the cross. Uh, and she said, you know, she said no. But then there came a point in time where she couldn't live without him. And so when she couldn't live without him, uh, she finally says, uh, this is in Song of Solomon 4, 6. You know, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. So what she was saying, I'll go to the cross. I'll go, I'll embrace the cross. I will let you deal with me to, to, to nail this sin and that sin and that self issue on the cross so that I can, because I want you more than I want to hang on to these issues in my heart. So she said, I'll go to the hill of, uh, of mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense until the cool of the day, until, in other words, until uh, I'm completely transformed. 
And it's interesting, a couple of things happen there. Right after that, he calls her his bride for the first time. You can see it right after that. He calls her the bride for the first time. But then he says this. Let's see. I think I've got this scripture written out. Yeah. Then, then he says this. How much better is your love than wine? The king is saying this to the maiden. Your love is better than wine. And the fragrance of your oils are better than all kinds of spices. So here's the point. And, then we, and we sit also, let me just, one more scripture. We sit in 2 Corinthians. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are, fra we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to one an aroma from death to death, and to the other an aroma from life to life, and who is adequate for these things. So here's the point. Here's the point. When we embrace the cross, when we say, Lord, have your way, uh, not only do, does there, is there a cleansing work done, but our life becomes a sweet fragrance unto Christ. Our life becomes a, a, a spices and aroma that emits to Christ. Now, I, you know, I can't prove this, but I believe there really is a spiritual fragrance of our, of our life that comes to heaven when we have really embraced the cross. The more we do it, the more that our life style is one that submits to the cross. Our life becomes a sweet aroma, a fragrance. And see, that's what the, 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 the and going back to Esther, that's what the spices did so that, so that the young lady would uh, emit a beautiful fragrance to him. And then the cosmetics are the external beauty, the glory, the glory of Christ that will come upon the bride who submits uh, themselves to the king. And so they say, that's what he's wanting to do in our lives. He's wanting to take us to the cross. He's wanting to, uh, us to, to cooperate with him on that so that our life is cleansed and that, that we become a sweet aroma to the king. But the only one place that happens is, from, is when, we, when we say we cooperate with the Holy Spirit and with the eunuchs, the forerunners. We have to cooperate with them uh, over our whole life. Some of the things are fairly easy. Some of them are really, really hard. You know, I've been doing this now. Donna and I have been doing this for 45 years, maybe something like that. You know, and there have been some really big decisions that we had to say, have your way, Lord. And there have been some that have not been so big. But, you know, I mean, I don't, wanna, I don't want to, this to come across. You know, one of the things that I, I don't really like when I hear it, I, I don't want to come across that you, this means you've got to be miserable all your life in order to do it. I don't believe that for a second. You know, the more we have surrendered our life to the Lord, yes, there have been difficult situations. Yes, a lot of them, a lot of them. But the more joy we've had, the more blessing we've had. You know, just, just different things, you, you know, not... not masses of money and, uh, you know, all the things like that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. If that is better than not having it, I'm, I'm for having it more than not. But it's just the, the blessing of walking with the Lord. And, and it's there with that. So this lifestyle is not like, okay, hold your nose and you live for 70 years miserable. <laughs> and then at, at the end of that misery, hopefully you'll be the bride. No. It's not that. There are there definitely are seasons of brokenness and difficulty and all of that. 
But it all, even in those things, when you come through them, are, are great joy. But he won't. Be, but we've got to live this way, though, if we want to be that fragrance unto Christ. That will he will that will be that pleasing aroma unto him. All right, Amen. Okay. Um, okay. Next one, fifth one. Being made ready as a bride requires a believer to overcome Jezebel requires a believer to overcome Jezebel. Uh, you, you know, if you're going back to Vashti, now Vashti to me is a picture of the work of Jezebel in our own life, okay? It's not like that person is a Jezebel. I'm not going to point to anybody. That person is a Jezebel. Oh, that's a Jezebel over there. <laughs> it's not that. Even No, it's not that. Every one of us has some Jezebel in us. And if we don't now, we did. We, you know, I know we've been through a lot of uh, ministry for that spirit. But if we either have it or we don't. But here's what, okay, so let's take the picture. Vashti is that picture of Jezebel. Because she was independent. She was rebellious. She would not submit to uh, her husband. She was not submit to the king. She would not do those things. And so what did he say to her? There are a couple of things he said. He said first, he said, man, he got his leaders together. We got to deal with this spirit. This, we got to deal with this Vashti. If we don't deal with her, she's going to convince every woman in the kingdom not to submit to their husbands. Whoa, yeah. But, you know, just look what's going on in the world. Jezebel is having her way in a lot of different issues globally. Now, and, you know, this is a little bit of a side note, but when the spirit of Jezebel is either, either in the, and the spirit of Jezebel is not just affecting women, Okay. It affects men just as much. But if the spirit of Jezebel is in a marriage, it creates all sorts of turmoil. It creates a, it creates a, a real mess. So it's very, very important, very important. Uh, if you're married or going to get married, get that spirit out of your marriage, out of your family. Really, really a huge issue there. But even more important, what did, what did he say about Vashti? He said, Vashti shall never again be in my presence. Whoa. So we got to overcome that spirit, whether it's a flesh issue or a demonic issue or whatever. We got to overcome it because if we don't overcome it, it'll definitely hinder, uh, you know, the, the bride making herself ready. I mean, the, the message at Thyatira, you know, we dealt with that in the earlier sessions. We dealt with the fact that we have to overcome these things in order to be bridal in nature. Jezebel, you know, Jesus said to the Thyra Tower, I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. He was saying that in the church, but we, we tolerate it in our lives. We tolerate it in our homes. We tolerate it here. We tolerate it there. And the Lord says, get rid of it. Overcome it. Overcome it. Uh, and so that's a major issue. I think it, I think it stands out unique in certain ways from other issues and all the tentacles of it. And here's the reason. You know, you look at Revelation 17 and 18. You see, okay, in Revelation 19, you see the bride has made herself ready. But the harlot has come down before the bride has made herself ready. Now the spirit behind 
the harlot, according to Revelation 18, 4, I believe it is, it's in Revelation 18 for sure, is a quote from Isaiah 47, which is the queen of heaven, which is the territorial spirit, whereas the spirit of Jezebel is one that comes into churches or into individual lives, into uh, marriages and families. He says, I tolerate this. You, I have this against you. You tolerate. So here's the issue. There's a harlot and there's a bride. And one of the predominant spirits that are affecting the harlot is the spirit of Jezebel, the queen of heaven, which uh, is also connected to the spirit of Jezebel. And so we need to overcome. We need to overcome that, that spirit, because it, it is a, in direct opposition to the bridal preparation, more so than like anger or fear or other issues, although we need to overcome you know, different issues, but we must overcome uh, Jezebel. The sixth one is being made ready as a bride requires a believer, a believer to develop a deeply loving and intimate personal relationship with Christ. A deep, loving, and intimate personal relationship with Christ. See, that's what really... The preparation was to prepare her for that one night with the king. And it was the intimacy of that. Again, we take it out of the natural into the spirit. We, it was the, that relationship that had the king choose her to be the queen, to be his wife. And so, you know, there's no shortcut for a, for a close relationship with the Lord, a personal relationship with the Lord. You know, it, it, if you look at the, in Esther chapter 2, and you have to go look on your own, but, you know, the king loved Esther. He was, and she loved him. She wanted to please him. She only did what, what the, the eunuch advised her to do. And so there was that relationship, that, that uh, uh, pleasing in the secret place. Now, we take it out of that realm into the spiritual realm. We, we, we need to have joy and and enjoyment in the secret place with the Lord. It's so important, so important. Uh, it's necessary to be selected, to be that part of the bridal company where the wife makes herself <coughs> ready and it becomes the eternal partner for the Lord. So, and I know people are different seasons of life, you, you know, different times, seasons of life with kids and uh, school and all sorts of, you know, work issues and all that. And the Lord knows those things. But in the midst of that, we have to develop that relationship based on where we are in life. I know, you know, I'm able to spend a lot more time with the Lord now than I was 30 years ago, you know. But, and, and I, you know, there's different times and seasons but the relationship includes time set aside for him, but it also includes just an attitude of the heart too, to develop that attitude of relationship with him, abiding in the vine uh, with him. So anyway, that's uh, enough said uh, about that one. And then the final one, this is the final one. Seventh, being made ready require, requires the bride to have confidence in God's love and grace while waiting, while waiting and fervently praying for God to make her ready as a bride. Let me read this. In the evening, she would go in, this is talking about any of the ladies, she would go in and in the morning she would return to the second harem, to the custody of Shagaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would, <coughs> she would not again go in to the king unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. So all of the young ladies after their night with the king would go to this different harem. And you can imagine the attitude, the uncertainty and the fear and the anxiety 
you know, do I have to spend the rest of my life, and I was, I'm assuming some did, would I have to spend the rest of my life never, you know, with the king, or with any, even, would I ever never be able, because they would never be able to marry anybody else once they went in. And so there was a, there was a, it was a test, a time of great testing. Now, pull it into our relationship. You know, we've, we've said yes to the Lord. We've cooperated with him the best we know how. We've tried to develop that. Yeah, you know, we look at our life and we say, man, I see a lot of flesh still in my life. I see a lot of self still in my life. Will it be good enough to be made ready, to be selected? It's a time of testing. Uh, you know, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to give an account of our life and will we get that reward of being the eternal wife of the Lamb? There's a testing there, a waiting. And so we have to have confidence in that. Yes, I'll, 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 he, will have, he will say yes to me because I, we've got to believe that. But at the same time, we've got to cry out, God, you know, I've done and I'm still doing everything that I know to do, but I cry out, God, make me ready. I don't want to spend the rest of my life in Shagaz's, I'm sure I'm pronouncing this wrong, Shagaz's harem. I want to, I want to be your your wife. <laughs> I'm getting older. I'm not nearly as appealing to you, I know, but I want. <laughs> but I don't want to be in that harem the rest of my life. Help me. <laughs> and that's where the Lord. That's where a lot of us are. Maybe, you know, the younger ones that are just starting the journey, maybe not so much. But those of us that have been on this journey for a long time, we're saying, Lord, I've got to. Please help me to finish the drill and do what I need to do and be what I need to be. Um, but then Esther was chosen to be the wife of the king. And I believe we also, if we put our heart and energy into it, we too will be the wife of the king. Amen. Amen. All right. Starts with saying yes. Let's just let's stand up and let's uh, let's just say yes if you want to. It's not just an emotional thing. It's yes that leads your transformation of your life. Leads you to pursue this all the days of your life. Father, I, I know I say once again, I say yes. And I, I pray and I believe that everybody in this room and everybody listening will say yes as well. Lord, because we, we want to be made ready. We want to be the eternal wife of the Lamb. We want to be your eternal partner in the end times as well as in the ages to come. We want that, Lord. And Lord, yet, I know this is me I, and probably everybody, I look at my life and I see my weaknesses and my flesh and my frailties and my inability to do things. I see issues that over my life that come back and all kinds of issues. And I say, I'm weak. But Lord, we know you are strong. And we ask that in your strength that you would take our weaknesses and remove them our sin, our self, those issues, remove them from our hearts and our lives that we could be a people made ready. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Amen. So we'll just end the online here, Doug. Let me know.